So in this section, we're going to look at factors that regulate populations, population size. And your learning outcomes are going to be to compare density-dependent and density-independent factors, which are a couple of vocabulary concepts, and then evaluate why the size of some populations goes through cycles, and then consider how the life history adaptations of a species may differ among, uh, differ depending on how often populations are at their carrying capacity. So we're going to start with a term called density dependent. So uh, a density dependent factor, and there's an illustration here on the right. And uh, what this illustration is showing is that the uh, uh, things like mortality rate and birth rates are influenced, uh, and these are factors that affect your, your population size, are influenced by just how many are there. Uh, so if you have many individuals, there's going to be a lot more competition uh, for limited resources. Uh, so that could increase mortality rate, death rates, and that could uh, decrease birth rates. And you can see here in the simple case where you have a bunch of uh, field rodents out here, uh, attract, attracting a predator here. So with the lower density of these rodents, their overall death rate, the percentage of them dying to predation would be lower. But when you have a whole bunch of these mice here, you're going to attract more predators potentially, and that could increase the rate at which uh, these uh, um, uh, rodents uh, die, their, their mortality rate. And we can also look at the population of these, look at it from the point of the predator. If there's not a lot of food for them, then you're limited on how many uh, 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 hawks or falcons you can have. If you have a lot of food, then your birth rate would be higher and so on. So these are, these depend, these factors depend on just how many individuals you have in the population. Okay? And then there's density independent factors. These don't depend on how dense you are. Uh, and these factors, so they don't depend on how many of the individuals in the population you have, what your density, your population size here is. Uh, and here, these uh, situations, the factors that are going to be factors that influence the size of the population are usually non-living or abiotic factors, like natural disasters, like a flood, like in the model we see here to the right, uh, a fire, some, some extreme event here. And so what you see here is they show up a case where there's a flood and you have a population of rodents. And in this case, simple case here, you have uh, about uh, five individuals there, a uh, low density uh, population there. And the flood ends up taking out three of them, which means 60% uh, of them are fatalities, right? Now, if you have a denser population and you have that flood, which is, it's not a living factor, it's just some abiotic natural disaster. If we went and we counted up all the mice, the fatality rate or the mortality is still gonna, was still the same percentage. So it did not matter on how many individuals you were there, the death rate stayed the same regardless. So that's different when it comes to the other one, the density dependent factors there. How many are out there will influence at what rate you have births and what rate you have deaths. The rate actually changes with density. So that's a big difference there. Okay, so looking at density dependent effects. Um, uh, these effects are gonna occur when uh, reproduction or survival are affected by population size. So when we talk about reproduction, that would be the birth rate. And when we talk about survivors, uh, survival, that could be survivorship, the rate of surviving, or we can look at it from the alternative, we can look at it at, uh, as mortality rate. So these are rates and they, they're ratios, how many are dying per number of individuals in that population, right? So. Uh, what we see here is that when population size increases, the number of individuals in, living in that area, your birth rates, which are your reproductive rates, are going to decline. How many you, you can have? Because there's so many, there's just not enough resources. You're, you're limited. The, uh, the, alternative, the alternate of that could be an, uh, mortality rates increase. So uh, in this case, the number that are dying uh, as a percent uh, would increase because there's a lot of them out there. So uh, these represent, it represents a sort of negative feedback within, not within an individual, but within a system called the population. So populations can experience uh, outputs and inputs and feedbacks just like uh, an individual can that we were talking about uh, at the beginning of this chapter here. So 
what happens here is that when your population increases, there's going to be an increase in competition for limited resources. You may have an increase in predation, like in that uh, diet, that picture I showed you earlier with the hawk and the mice. Uh, too many individuals can also accumulate waste products that can become toxic. Uh, the, all living things generate waste, and you have too many individuals in there. That waste can actually come back and cause uh, uh, health problems with that population here. So you can see here in the first graph the case of uh, these are going to be your rates. How many individuals uh, per entire population size, right? Okay, so or, or per hundred or per thousand. So it's a, a, per, a percentage or a per number of individuals. These are your rates. Okay, so here when you have uh, your population increase, but only birth rates are affected here, right? So uh, down here on this axis is population density. So as you move to the right, your population is increasing here. So here when only that only affects birth rates, you're going to see a change in that rate. That's why there's a slope there. Remember this axis here is rate. So what you see here is that you are uh, your uh, the rate of birth is going to decrease the bigger your population gets. And it's going to decrease here, uh, and the death rates, it does not matter. So and this is a case where only birth rates matter. So as the population increases, your death rates stay the same, but your, um, your birth rates, which are density dependent, are going to decrease here. So at the point where both the death rates and the birth rates intersect right here, you're at an equilibrium, and that would be where your population, uh, the rate of, of your change in your population stays the same. Assume no immigration or e-migration, the rates of death of birth and the rates of death are the same. The number of individuals uh, per, uh, uh, the number of deaths and births per a certain number of individuals as a percent, you can re represent that, right? So here, your birth rates are pretty high. Let's say they're 80% uh, and so on uh, or whatever. And then as you come here, the percentage is decreasing, decreasing, and decreasing. And then all of a sudden you get to where your death rates never change and they're at that certain uh, rate here, maybe 50% or whatever. When these two match, the number of births and the number of deaths match right here, you have a balance now between um, uh, uh, the ones dying and the ones living. Uh, and that means your population density stays the same. Now, the alternate is here in case where the birth rates does not matter how many you have out there because this is population density here on the x-axis here. So that line stays the same. So that uh, rate of birth stays the same regardless of your population size. It's independent of it. But over here, your death rate depends on it. So the greater your population, what happens? your death rate increases, right? The point where those two intersect, you're at equilibrium, and that means your population would be uh, not be changing in any in any way. Your population size would be the same. The density would stay the same uh, when those two match. And then here, when both are affected, both birth rates and death rates at the same time. So we know that when your as your population increases, we know that's going to cause a decrease in birth rates. We see that. So your, death, your birth rates are decreasing, how many are born in the population, uh, and also, as you're increasing in density, that tremendous competition causes a greater death rate. So your death rate is increasing. And when both of these, again, meet in the middle, that's when your population is increasing uh, in equilibrium and you don't see any change there. Okay. Uh, we see this here. Uh, this is actual data from a song sparrow. Uh, is the common name. Melospiza melodia is the fancy scientific name there. And what they're doing is they're looking at the birth and death rates for um, uh, young and the juvenile uh, mortality. So those are the young birds, right? And so what we see here is as you have an increase in the population size as indicated by the number of breeding adults in that population. So here they're counting the number of breeding adults and then they're observing um, the the number of young that are being born as the number of breeding adults increases there. And this is in blue. So what's happening here? Again, the data is all messy, but you do your best fit line and you see what, what we predict based on the models from earlier. You see that as the number of the population size increases by the number of breeding adults, you see that the number of juveniles that are born uh, decreases your birth rate. And why is that? The, well, there's going to be competition for resources. It's harder to raise young, and it's harder to build up enough energy to have bigger clutch sizes. 
Also, what happens when you have a larger population is your population increases this way. What happens to your mortality rate for those juveniles? That increases. So the number that are born don't live it to don't live to become an adult. Uh, the the number increases the rate at which they die. At some point, the two lines meet. And the, uh, the uh, population size for the juvenile cohort stays about the same. So we see that with actual data. Okay. Now, um, there's uh, these mechanisms uh, when you have high densities can have a behavioral response. So not necessarily uh, a response in uh, death rates and birth rates, but a change in behavior based on uh, negative feedback due to high density. So now we're not talking about necessarily about birth and death rates, but behaviors that may work on these uh, uh, these populations uh, in a way that they try to prevent. Uh, uh, individuals uh, are uh, trying to survive so that, that we don't see maybe a change in, in birth or death rates. So what happens here? Uh, what we see in some behaviors, let's say when rodents uh, populations get too high, you're going to see an increase in uh, stresses within this population. So you see more fighting and less breeding. Uh, and if you have more fighting because there's high competition, then there's no time for breeding. So that's going to br help bring the numbers down. So there's a negative feedback. Population increases. Behavior changes. You're fighting. You're not breeding. Uh, yeah, I guess they're fighters and not lovers at this point because there's not enough resources, right? Uh, and then... Um, uh, some behavior may be uh, migration, right? So you may uh, emigrate out of the area if your population size is too high. So perhaps some stress and hormones increase. And they have an example here with locusts. Uh, here they become migratory when their populations are real high. They split the scene uh, probably because they've stripped the area of, um, of resources. So uh, there there's a negative feedback and there's a behavioral component to it. Now, in some cases, an increase in population is accompanied by an increase in growth rates. So that we see a counterintuitive thing. Your population starts to get uh, bigger, and we see uh, that the growth rate is increasing. That doesn't happen. That's not the normal. So this is a, sort of a positive feedback instead. More numbers, you get a higher population. Okay? So that's uh, called the alley effect here. Um, and it's not the normal case, but it, it has been observed here. So this could happen when you have a very sparsely distributed population. So you have individuals spread over a wide area. At some point, they start coming together into an area, and that might encourage breeding. Uh, so more of them are collecting within an area. Their density is increased there, and then now that uh, stimulates breeding uh, situations. So we see this in some animals. Uh, and again, it's not the normal, but it, it's kind of an example of positive feedback within a population system. Uh, so density independent uh, effects include environmental disruptions and catastrophes. We were talking about that earlier with that flooded stream. We introduced density dependent and density independent at the very beginning with those diagrams, and we just finished covering density dependent uh, situation. Now we're looking at uh, density independent, so it doesn't matter how many you have out there, it does not change uh, mortality rates, for example, here. Uh, so, uh, in, uh, in the, and it, so regardless of what your population size is in, the rate doesn't change. So this is always going to be abiotic, something in the environment or a catastrophe uh, that happens. So always think non-living things, right? So uh, non-living abiotic here. So here, the rate of your population uh, at any instant in time is um, is limited by something that's not related to the population there. So you might have a severely cold winter, a drought, volcano, a thunderstorm that uh, brings in a flood uh, overall. So those are things that uh, uh, doesn't matter how many you have, there's going to be a certain uh, death rate or, or uh, even birth rate here. So uh, populations can display these erratic growth patterns when, uh, for example, you have extreme uh, events uh, that are going to be frequent. So maybe you have uh, constant, um, uh, very cold winters or something like that. And, and so you're going to see this erratic uh, population changes. And so that's seen here uh, with these moth species in a specific area. These are different moth species that are sympatric. 
Uh, they live together, and these are species found in Germany there. And what you see that's common to all of them as they were tracking the population over these years is you actually see similar ups, uh, similar declines, and then similar up patterns again. And that would suggest that this erratic fluctuations, but they're mirrored by each one of them, would be caused by something that's non-living in the environment. It does not depend on how many moths you have out there. So uh, maybe it's some quite a sort of regular pattern in extreme weather in that area. And so that, that uh, those erratic patterns can be uh, a sign of uh, density independent uh, effects on population size. Now, population cycles may uh, reflect uh, complex interactions uh, within the environment. And this is a very famous uh, example of a lynx, which is kind of like a bobcat. It's a closely related species. And the snowshoe hare, uh, which is uh, uh, adapted for a very cold climate here. And they got this data from way back in 1845 all the way to 1935, back during the fur trade times where they would trap these animals and then kill them for their fur and sell them in the market. Uh, and so they collected data on how many pelts or skins they got. And so they have these data here and you start to see these patterns here where when you look at it, the blue line is the snowshoe hare and the red is the, is the predator. And every time you see an increase in the hair, uh, uh, the hair starts to increase in its population. And then it's followed by an increase in the population of lynx, as indicated by the number of uh, animals they were trapping and killing for fur. So then you see that every time. Increase in hair, then an increase in the number of lynx pelts. Uh, and so you see this pattern repeated over and over again. And so that would suggest that the number of prey, uh, the rabbit, uh, influences how many predators can be supported there. Uh, and so uh, these cycles were going on in about 10-year cycles, roughly, uh, overall. But some uh, closer studies showed uh, that, that these uh, definitely, de depending on how dense each population is, right? If you have a lot of rabbits, it's dense, then the rabbit's mortality rate's going to increase, and so they start to drop. And is the rabbit's cycle based on the predator, the lynx, or is it based on their food supply? And so it turns out the data is showing that it was kind of both. So there was a sort of bottom-up control because the plants are in the bottom of the food chain. Uh, if you have a lot of rabbits, they're going to be eating a lot of their food, and they may out-eat the, uh, the area's ability to, uh, uh, to sustain that population, right? And then there's the top-down effect on that rabbit from the predators, right? At the same time, the amount of rabbit is also kind of controlling how many predators are out there. So it's really a very complex uh, interaction uh, of bottom up from how much food is available for the rabbits and from the top down from the predator there. There's a nice little study there by Krebs who's uh, published a study analyzing these data uh, and studying them in a little more detail. So um, now uh, one of the... Uh, the influences of how the environment can influence your death rate and your birth rate overall, species have to be able to reproduce efficiently enough to where they leave enough to continue that species into the future over generations, right? So uh, as these factors influence births and death rates over many generations, there tends to be a pattern that you see in these species that was shaped by these factors, okay? And so these patterns that arise in these populations are seen in their life histories, okay? So I mentioned earlier that life history is a life cycle, but it's more than that. When we talk about life history, we're considering what kinds of patterns these species have in the context of how the environment has shaped them, how natural selection has shaped it, these patterns. Okay, So there's that added component when you talk about life histories. It's still a life cycle. There's characteristics about the life cycle overall, uh, but we, we, we start to see patterns and we can relate it to uh, these factors we've been talking about. So uh, all of this is due to the fact that every species experiences limited resources, and this is even true of humans, uh, 
there's only so much uh, planet Earth uh, here. So uh, we do have a lot of technologies to allow us to go past these limiting things. But these would be things that would take a species population size to a certain carrying capacity that the environment can sustain, right? So here the idea is selection favors individuals within a population that can compete and utilize resources efficiently. So you have a population, there's variation in there, and which individuals are able to do it better with all of the factors, whether it's predators coming after you, your ability to get food and resources, and still have enough energy to reproduce and leave offspring that are just like you. If you can't do that, then your population and your species is probably not going to look like you in the future because uh, you're going to, uh, individuals that are more like you are going to leave less offspring, right? Uh, so that intense competition overall works to lower uh, your reproductive rates and the, the types of individuals can reproduce in there. So over time, your population and your species get shaped uh, in ways in which they can efficiently uh, get their resources and leave offspring. So there is a... Um, a category that we're going to refer to as case-selected populations, and it's sort of relevant to that carrying capacity, right? There's going to be limitations in that environment for resources here. So a case-selected species is going to be adapted when a population is near its carrying capacity. In other words, these populations have figured out a way, despite the, the low, low uh, or uh, limitations on the resources that can sustain your population, they figured out a way to, to get by generation after generation and still leave enough offspring for uh, for, uh, for the future. Uh, and so typical case like this species would include coconut palms, uh, a pretty big bird called a whooping crane, whales, and humans are actually case selected. Um, and then there's the alternative here. This, these are going to be called R selected. Uh, and this one's more related to their their intrinsic rate for growth. This is something we discussed in the earlier section. All populations have a capacity to grow exponentially if there were no limited resources. This is the idea here. If your population is lower than what the carrying capacity is uh, regularly, then natural selection is going to favor this kind of life history that we would refer to as R selected here. Uh, and we're going to look at the, what are the characteristics of each, right? So here, if you're living in an area where your population is lower than the carrying capacity, there's a lot of resources, there's abundance there. Uh, so the cost to reproduce is not going to be very, uh, very high. It's going to be low. So you can actually reproduce quickly and rapidly and so on. So there's a tremendous uh, uh, capacity for these populations to grow. So here... Uh, natural selection is going to favor high reproductive rates, right? And so we're going to refer to these as R selected because the way these populations grow is like a J-shaped exponential uh, curve here. So uh, individuals that show this are like dandelions, which are uh, those flowers that produce those uh, seeds that fly away in the wind. Insects are R selected, mice are R selected, and indeed they are capable of exploding in their population size. So uh, most individuals are going to be somewhere between uh, a strict K selection or an R selection. That's always uh, true. So there's a, sort of a continuum between or the other. But if we were to put two opposites uh, of uh, something that we would say this is purely K selected and this other population or species is purely R selected, we would see these characteristics. Okay, so for an R selected, which their populations uh, over long periods of time tend to have been below their carrying capacity. The age at which they first reproduce, which is called generation time, is going to be early. So they reproduce at a early, earlier uh, time, uh, in less time, months, a uh, year maybe. A case selected is later. They're going to go a lot longer before they become uh, reproductively mature. The lifespan of R selected, they don't live very long. Mice don't live long. Insects don't live long. A whale lives a long time. A human lives relatively long time. Maturation time. How long does it take to become mature enough to reproduce? Short for R selected, long for K selected. Uh, where, again, remember, K selection has been under the influence of limited resources for a long period of time. These species have evolved 
uh, in situations where they're constantly at carrying capacity and competing with each other and with uh, other species. Uh, then mortality rate. If you are selected, mortality rate is high. That means lots of uh, individuals in that population die out all the time. Uh, so the high reproductive rates matches high mortality rates. And then uh, here, case selected, mortality rates usually low. That's why you're always at that high carrying capacity. Uh, and then the number of offspring produced per episode or effort, many. Anytime an insect reproduces, they're going to lay a lot of eggs, right? For a whale or a human, few. Anytime they reproduce. Uh, number of uh, reproductive uh, reproductions or efforts you do per lifetime, few. Uh, you leave offspring and once, maybe twice, and then you're gone. Uh, for case selected, they could reproduce many times throughout their lifespan. Parental care for are selected. Ones that live below, they just throw out a bunch of eggs and then take off. Not very much parental care there. Hope some of them survive, right? For case selected, Parental care is important. You need to protect that offspring because it was hard enough for you to get them to be born in the first place, uh, right? Because your reproductive rates are low. Uh, and then uh, over here, the size of offspring or the eggs are going to be relatively small. Lots of insect eggs, right? And for uh, case selected, it's going to be relatively um, larger. So now we look at humans as a population, and we're going to be looking at humans, the entire global population. And then we'll look at populations uh, in different parts of the world, in different countries and continents. And so here your learning outcomes are to explain how the rate of human population growth has changed through time, understand the history of that growth. Uh, second one is to describe the effects of age distribution on future growth. So there we're going to look at uh, age, age pyramids again. Uh, which we learned how to interpret already, and then evaluate the relative importance of rapid uh, population growth, human population growth, and resource consumption uh, as threats to the biosphere and human welfare. As we grow in population, we need more resources to continue to survive, to uh, food and um, other things. So uh, there's a concern on that. So uh, humans are very case-selected. Uh, as far as our life histories go. And this probably occurred as uh, natural selection was working on these early hominids that we talked about uh, in the chapter that covered mammals. Uh, and this is because hominids grew up in an environment where resources are limited. So that is going to work to control your population size. So remember that case selected from the prior section, you're going to have a smaller brood size. So as we have... Um, typically one offspring per effort, and then um, there's only so many you can have during your lifespan. Uh, reproduction is later. Don't reproduce at the age of one or two years old. you got to go to uh, 15, 16, 17 or older. Uh, there's a high degree of parental care. All of these are case-selected traits. Now, the human population has grown exponentially as a J-shaped curve. Um, there's going to be changes since the 1700s that allow uh, humans to escape this, uh, what would be a logistic growth, where we're at a carrying capacity. And so some of those things include the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s, where we're able to move large amounts of materials, use larger amounts of energy to create things and grow food and so on. Another big deal that happened is the medicine revolution, antibiotics as well. Uh, and so um, what's happening here? Well, birth rates... Uh, have been relatively stable. Remember we were doing graphs where we were talking about density dependent factors and so on. Over here we had birth rates and over here we had death rates. Okay, And so birth rates, uh, the rate at which uh, individuals are born has, re let's say, we remained relatively stable. Okay, Not much. Flat line there. So the birth rate stayed the same for birth. Okay? I'm going to use the solid line for birth. And then this is death over here. So uh, the thing is that prior to 1700, death rates were pretty uh, pretty big. And this is your population size, where population size is higher over here and lower over here. So as you move to the right, you're getting higher. So you remember, the higher your population size, the higher your death rate. So let's say that this was uh, the way the human population is, and this would be equilibrium right here. That population size where your death rates and your birth rates match. Okay. So that higher the population size got, the higher the death rate was, right? But when death rates fell, 
uh, dramatically. After the 1700s, what happens to the steepness here? It's going to be more like this. And what does that mean? That means that now uh, our population size is going to be higher uh, when, when those two match. Uh, and the question is, have they matched yet? I don't think they actually really have uh, overall. There's still uh, continued growth at an exponential rate. It's just not as rapid. There's different levels of exponential growth. So this is what the graph actually looks like. So we go all the way back to estimates of how big the global population was going all the way back 4,000 BC. Remember, humans have been around uh, the earliest humans, you got to go back 200,000, depending on what you count as Homo sapiens or a broader group of hominids that uh, might include Neanderthal, uh, Neanderthalus and, and uh, another species. And you may go back 600,000 years, but we're tracking back here. Uh, and this right here is in the billions of people. So this is 1 billion, 2 billion. As you see, we're well below here. Uh, and then uh, we, we, we even see a situation where we had the Black Plagues. We had significant drop in uh, population size. And then uh, you're getting to about uh, the Middle Ages here. And then uh, you're going to uh, where the Black Plague was. And then you get to the 1700s here. And boom, you see that massive skyrocket. There's that J-shaped curve right there. Exponential growth is very powerful. And indeed, uh, I think in 2011 or so, we hit 7 billion mark. I remember when I was in high school, we were like in uh, 4 to 5 billion range. Uh, and so uh, the human population growth hit a high growth rate because of lower death rates and continued birth rates. Uh, the population growth rate uh, was at 2%. So this is what you get when you balance the birth rates and the death rates overall. Okay. And this was between 1965 and 1970. Today in 2015, global population uh, uh, increase is still at 1.1%. Anytime you're not at zero, you're still growing. So it's still going to be exponential. It's just uh, going to be uh, not as fast as at 2%. Now at this lowered rate, the total global population would still be increasing at 75 million people on this planet every year, that many more. Uh, and I'm going to give you all an equation that you do need to know, uh, and it's called doubling time. So I'm going to say T double. And it's based on a, on a more complex uh, exponential equation that when you, when you solve for it, you're solving for what happens when your number doubles. And uh, it ends up giving you a rough equation of uh, what we call the rule of 70. So you take 70 and you're going to divide it by the percent of change. And so if we were to do divide 70 by 1.1, which is the percent change, right? It's increasing the doubling time and it's per year. This is a percent uh, of change every year. If you divide 70 by 1.1, you get the 63 years. So it would take 63 years at this current rate for the population to double. If it was 2% and we put a 2 down here, then the answer would be 35. It would take 35 years to double. So just the difference between 2% and 1.1%. The concern is just how many people can this planet continue to sustain? We've had a lot of uh, uh, revolutions, the discovery of antibiotics. We've had the green revolutions where we learned to grow food. Uh, and then we learned to use fertilizers and we learned to use massive machines to grow all of this food. So we have a lot of technologies that are allowing us to increase more and more of that carrying capacity, but that's coming at an expense to Earth's other systems. They're being degraded uh, uh, at a higher rate. And Earth's ability to renew and regenerate itself, uh, replenish water supply, fresh water into aquifers underground, uh, soil. The amount of what they call arable land for us to be able to grow all of these things we're using at a faster pace than nature can replace it so there's a big concern there so uh we're getting to that point where we're we're going to ask that question here in the section but here uh we can look at population pyramids which we've already done before and we can also examine uh, uh, to show uh what's going on with birth rates and death rates and so on but here this table is going to look at what the projected growth is going to be in the global population uh, at the year 2050. So we're looking at what is the population size going to be at different in different places around the world globally. In the continent of Africa, we can see 
uh, that in the year 2005. So we're already 15 years behind where that is. Who knows where their uh, population is? We'd have to look it up. But this is the population size for all of Africa, uh, and this is in the um, in the uh, millions. So 907 million. They're just uh, in 2005. You're uh, about 100 million shy of a billion. So at a thousand millions, you're at a billion, right? Uh, and so on. So you can see here in Africa, Africa, uh, the continent itself is projected to uh, shoot up significantly. Uh, looks like it's uh, more than doubled, more than doubled by the year 2050. So you're getting near 2 billion people. Asia. Asia is already at, uh, looks like 5.3 billion. And that's projected to go up to 6.7 billion. And then here in Australasia here, uh, which uh, is aus Austral means in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, so we include uh, um, uh, Australia there. So they're at 33 uh, million and projects to go to 48 million. It's not much growth going there. Europe, Europe's actually predicted to have a decrease. They have actually negative exponential growth there. North America, where the United States, Canada is, um, in Mexico, we're expected to go from half a billion to uh, six point, uh, 680 million. Uh, and then here in South America, you're going to see also some increase, but not as much as we see in uh, Africa. And where do we tend to see more of this growth? More of this growth occurs in places where there's a lot of poverty. So there's a connection there. Um, and so I uh, want you to think about that for a bit. Uh, so the projected growths are uneven. Where is the distributed? Mostly where will most of the where this growth rate is going to be the greatest in uh, places where there's a lot of poverty, uh, and we call those uh, the, sometimes they, the the poor the older terms would be like poor countries and so on. Here they call them developing. It just sounds nicer, right? They're working hopefully to develop their economies and the way the uh, things are going for them. Uh, where growth rates negative, growth rates are negative in uh, uh, European countries. Uh, uh, it was the only only place there, so any countries there that are in that uh, area. Uh, and these are in developed countries uh, where they've already gone through their industrial revolution and so on. Uh, so, what's a big influence on there? Poverty is the answer to that question. Okay. So uh, here we see two pyramids. We studied these eight structure pyramids earlier. We know that the base uh, down here in this bottom area would be the juveniles, the pre-reproductive. And then when we get to about the center right here, we have the case where uh, we have uh, males and females that are in their reproductive years, especially the females ones that uh, have the babies, right? And we know that when we see a blocky pyramid here, we know that this population is not growing. Their growth rate would be around 0%. Okay. Uh, over here, uh, when you have this real wide base, you're going to have massive growth. So you're going to have a higher growth rate. So maybe their growth rate is uh, 2%, 3%, 4%. The numbers we were giving you earlier were uh, for global average, right? So you're going to have some low ones. In fact, in Europe, it's a negative percent growth rate. Not, not zero, not positive, but negative. Anytime you're above zero, it's exponential growth. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is in Kenya, which is a country in Africa. And this is in Sweden, which uh, is uh, the European uh, region. So, um, and you remember, if you see a pyramid that looks where it has a smaller base like this, uh, then uh, that would be negative uh, percent or negative growth rate. So, um, we know how to read these pyramids here. So, uh, Looking at the future, there's a lot of uncertainty. Demographers who study human population, death rates, birth rates, and so on, which we've been talking about, they've tried to extrapolate and figure out where the population will be. And it depends on a number of factors. And one of them depends on how developed the countries are. depends on how much education uh, people have. It turns out that there is a correlation between uh, how much education um, uh, individuals have, especially female, women. Uh, early on and the year which they first start reproducing. If they start reproducing at a very early age, right when they first uh, hit maturity, they're going to tend to have a lot more babies. So the, uh, um, the fecundity, right, the number of individuals that you have uh, per uh, uh, 
the number of offspring you have per individual is much higher, so birth rates would be higher overall. If you delay and wait, and one factor is how much education you get, which is connected to how uh, wealthy that country is, uh, there tends to be a, a waiting time before they uh, have their first child. So overall, so basically the population growth is going to be uneven and you're going to see greater amounts of uh, growth rates in poorer nations where we would call them developing countries. So you can see here, this represents the total population right here. And the yellow area is the developed countries, which includes things like the United States, Canada, use some of the European countries, uh, Australia, for example, as well. The ones that are in, uh, shaded in red, the numbers that come from the red area, those are going to be from uh, poorer nations, uh, countries in Africa and uh, Asia and so on, uh, some of those countries over there. And what you see here is that there is a big difference. Most of the growth is going to be that difference there. Most of that growth is going to be in those poorer nations there. And there's a couple of different projections. These dotted lines are extrapolations, and they depend on a couple of factors, right? Just how uh, much more developed they become, uh, how, how much more educated they have, and so on. Uh, will depend on where those populations uh, begin to slow their growth rate. So this is the projection for how much the highest projection puts our global population at 10 billion. It already feels crowded at 7 billion in, in some case depends on where you live of course but uh, overall so this is kind of this is kind of scary out here uh, and then we move on to the future after that so keep this in mind it's an important idea here that the developing countries are going to have much lower um, uh, both birth rates and uh, death rates so hopefully you have that under control uh, as well uh, and it's a, ri a rich and poor type of thing is the connection there. So the big concern is regardless of who's contributing to what is wh what level is Earth going to continue to sustain this? There's got to be some sort of carrying capacity. Remember carrying capacity is some level we draw out here that, it, that nature shows overall and there's no other planet Earth. Okay, so that's a big deal and this is uh, uh, the humans, you know, where's K? That's the carrying capacity of what population size. K is that carrying capacity size. These questions have been uh, considered for some time now. There was a, a publication by Thomas Malthus. I don't know the year off the top of my head, but it's probably at least 1800s where, or early 1900s, maybe soon, maybe earlier than that. Um, I shouldn't even try to guess. Uh, but I know the name, and this is a person who is uh, talking about what are the limits for human population growth. Now, the concern has been there, uh, but new technologies are always uh, coming up and uh, allowing us to further increase carrying capacity. But again, it does not come at an expense because we're seeing a lot of de degradation and damage to the ecosystems on this planet. Uh, that's sustained overall. So here is some demographic data from the year 2010. This is already 10 years old data. Fertility rate is uh, the number of individuals or offspring that you have per female. And you can see 1.9. That's about replacement uh, overall, right? It's, so you, it, because the female has a partner, right? So it's her and her partner. The average. That doesn't mean... Uh, every female in the United States is having just about two kids per, uh, per per woman. Some have more, some have less, some have none. So this is the average. For Brazil, it's 1.8, and for Ethiopia, which is a poor nation in uh, Africa, is 4.6. So they have more there. Um, the doubling time, which is based on the percent of uh, population growth, that, you, that we talked about the rule of 70. When you do the calculation using the rule of 70, the percent growth for the United States gives us an, an answer of 99 for, um, I don't know what percent that is, but it's still above zero. Uh, it's um, it's going to be less than one because at one it would be 70 years. So uh, for Brazil, it's closer to one percent increase uh, population rate and use if you use the rule of 70 they get 77 years for doubling time but for ethiopia 27 so their growth rate is more than two percent right because at two percent you get 35 years 
uh, and that's less. So they're growing at uh, 2%, more than 2% rate. The mortality rates for infants. An infant would be considered at before reaching the age of five. Uh, and they keep these demographic data per thousand, not per hundred. Per hundred is a percent. Per thousand is uh, is what you do when sometimes the numbers are very low. Sometimes they keep track of demographic data per hundred thousand when the numbers are really, really small. But here in the United States, about six uh, infants die before the age of five uh, per thousand here. That's too many. But look at some of these other countries, 19 per thousand and 56 uh, per thousand in Ethiopia. Part of the reason for that is lack of access to health care uh, for both the woman and the child, uh, both prenatal and so on. So a lot of it has to do with health care, nutrition, and, us, and just living in a more impoverished uh, area of the world. Life expectancy for the United States in 2010 was 79 years of age. 74 and then uh, uh, 63 in Ethiopia. Life expectancy back in the early 1900s, 1800s was like in the 30s or 40s. So uh, we've gotten better because of medicine. Now per capita um, wealth here, this is per person. The total wealth uh, that one measures GDP is $53,000 per for every American or U.S. citizen. Doesn't mean we all have that much uh, wealth, uh, just on the average, that's what it is. For Brazil, it's 11000 and for Ethiopia, only $500. That is very low development uh, poverty. Uh, and then population um, of the, uh, so you, now you're looking at the population pyramids. So here we're looking at population, the percent that are less than 15 years of age. So that's your base of your pyramid. For the United States, 20% of the population is less than 15 years old, or so less than that that age where you, you you're usually hit uh, puberty and you're capable of reproducing. For Brazil, 24%. For Ethiopia, they have a big base, 41% less than 15 years old. Remember that population pyramid is going to look like the one we saw for Kenya on the on the uh, other page there. So they're growing very rapidly, uh, and we know that because we saw the doubling time. So what happens when your population increases? You can't get around it. You're going to need more space to grow more food, to get rid of more waste. So the consumption of resources continues to increase. And this is going to further deplete, degrade, and damage uh, uh, Earth systems, right? So it turns out that who's consuming the most is not even. You might have higher population sizes in impoverished areas of the world, but they're not using as many resources uh, per individual. So when we look at 20% of the world's population, that uh, the top 20% in terms of wealth, the richest, uh, the 20% of the, of the population, the top 20%. So in that in that in that group, you're talking about those that live in the richer countries. 20% of that world, the top 20% of the wealthiest uh, people on this planet in, in, their, in those countries are actually consuming 86% of the resources. So while they only make up the top 20% of the population, they're using 86% of the stuff that we're taking from the planet uh, in consumption. They're also generating 53% of the carbon dioxide, which we know is a greenhouse gas contributing to climate change and global warming. Now, when you look at the other end, the 20% of the population that's the poorest, that live in the poorest countries, um, they're only using 1.3% of the resources. Uh, so uh, that's just not sustainable. We have people who barely don't even have their basic needs met, and then we have other groups of people, and we're included, we do it too. We not only just have our needs met, we have our wants, like the extra things that we don't need just for basic uh, living. And those things, what are they? Nutrition, health care, education is important. That's a need that humans have, uh, right? Those are our basic needs, shelter, place to live. All those are basic needs. When we go beyond that, we are consuming a lot more of the share of what the earth has to provide. And these people who are in the poorest areas, don't even have shelter, don't have their nutrition met, and so on. And they only generate 3% of the, of the CO2 or greenhouse gases. So there's an issue because if only the top 20% is doing this, imagine if everyone else on the planet did it, all 7 billion people consumed at that same rate. 
forest wouldn't be able to sustain it at all. So where's the balance? What can we do? Perhaps smarter technologies that allow us to use things more efficiently would be good. So there is a big concept here that's important to know. It's called ecological footprint. This is defined as the amount of resources, which includes productive land for making food or getting uh, um, materials to build things that we use and, and want and need. Uh, and the amount of space needed to get rid of your waste, because we all generate waste, whether it's coming from our own bodies or things we just put in the trash and throw away, all of that is part of your ecological footprint. And what it is, it's a measure of how much of the Earth's uh, source, uh, surface is needed to sustain uh, the average individual, okay? on average. How much does it take to feed you? How much area of land does it take to grow the food you eat to get rid of the waste you generate that's the idea there and we see that those values here and compared to u.s germany which is in europe brazil and then some of the poorest countries we see where some of the poorest people live indonesia nigeria and so on and this number here those numbers that are here on this scale is the amount of uh, area on the planet i think it's in uh, acres um, yeah, acres. If it was hectares, it's a larger unit. These would be smaller, but you still get the same relative amounts. It takes about 23.2 acres for the average U.S. citizen to do this. All the food they eat, the other things that they do to consume things and the waste they generate. Uh, when you look at other developed nations like Germany and other places in Europe, only 10 acres. So, the United States is using twice as much as other uh, uh, per individual. Uh, so, uh, and they're doing just fine. So that tells me there's a lot of waste going on here that we could do better. For. Now, if you want to compare the U.S. citizen to some of the poorest ones here, uh, at only 2.2 uh, acres per individual in some of these poorest nations, that means the U.S. is consuming uh, more than 10 times what uh, the others are doing. Uh, do that measured by ecological footprint. So here's the big, big deal. What if all of these other countries rose up to the level that the U.S. Uh, so all of them, 23.2 acres per individual. Okay. And then you multiply that by 7 billion people. How many acres would that add up to? Well, let me tell you, it's a lot more than one planet Earth. Okay, so it's four, five, six planet Earths to sustain that kind of consumption. So something's going to give, and uh, I hope it's not too late. And, and so um, better technologies, I think, is going to help us uh, carry us to what the projected population growth rate is so that hopefully everybody has their basic needs met. That's the goal, ultimately, of 